I can remember that. Um, and I'm apologizing in advance. I'm waiting on an urgent message. So if I suddenly stop and look at my phone, it's because it's really important, not because I got bored. Um, if it happens to you, I'll know that the only reason you're looking at your phone is you have an urgent message. Oh, go away. And let me show you. The, yes, I'm sure I don't want to, and I don't want to know about photos. And I'm going to talk about interactive HTML. Uh, the only stock was very concrete and very, what do you do now? Some of this is ancient history, and some of this is very speculative. It's like problems and we don't have solutions. So thinking about ways to do it, if you have questions and if you have ideas, feel free to throw them in. It's like talking to developers and getting feedback on things we should be doing in, in standards and browsers is very important. Um, so I'm just going to look at how you do interaction stuff in HTML. How many, how many people here have used isIndex? One? I don't, do, I don't think I've used it. I might have done once for fun, but yeah. When HTML first appeared, that was how you did forms. You could type something in, and that was that. It had links, and it had an attribute called rel. Do, do people use the rel attribute? And obviously, everyone uses it for style sheets, right? But have you put it on other stuff, on normal links or on link elements? Because those used to be the, uh, the way you would get browser navigation tools that would find their way around a site. You know, if you had Opera back in 1990-some, you could actually automatically find your way around the contents and the next page and the index and various pages of a website. Uh, that was quite useful. People had keyboards and mice. Right? The first browser, www, the, the thing Tim made when he made the web, and the entire web consisted of a local server running on local host on his machine, on his desk, plus a copy of his browser on the same machine. It was an editing tool as well as a browser. You could hyperlink things and you could edit content in real time and save it back onto the server. So the web was kind of interactive. Uh, you had links, obviously, but not very. It was basic and it worked. Uh, you could hook up you know, services. The isIndex thing he made specifically so that you could search the CERN library catalog. Right? You'd send one search term and you would get the catalog. Uh, that was all it did. And you know, HTML grew and became famous, and cats started appearing, and pictures started appearing on the web, lots and lots of pictures. Some of them were cats. Uh, some of them were other stuff. But HTML got more interactive. And HTML itself got forms, so buttons, you know, menus, and text inputs, and various things. The kind of stuff Leone talked about, two kinds of image maps. Um, does anyone know what the two kinds were? Yeah, server-side and you know, client-side image maps. So client-side image maps were sort of a collection of links. Right? You would point from your image using a, to a map, and you get some links that you could navigate around and find things. It was great. Server-side image maps. They were really cool. You could have a picture, and you could say, this is a server-side map, is map. Click on it, and that would send a coordinate back to the server, which would process the coordinate on the image and figure out you know, what that pixel represented. It's kind of like canvas. You know. What's the problem? If you haven't got a mouse, it's sent back zero, zero. There was no other way. You know, it just sent back zero, zero. So you're kind of lost. Like, eh, that wasn't so good. So uh, server-side maps were popular for a while, because if you wanted to do complicated things like a map of the world, you, know, you would have to download kilobytes of content 
to have a, a whole map of the world with you know, the areas actually described as points. And, and once upon a time, you know, having sort of a 10 megabyte front page was seen as a bad thing. <laughs> HTML introduced a couple of cool things. It introduced an uh, access key and it introduced tab index. Uh, HTML also got the embed element that wasn't standardized ever until HTML5, but did work. And it got the uh, object element a little bit later. Excuse me while I forward this message. If I can figure out how to do it, that's even worse. So some other stuff came along in the 90s. We got CSS. We got uh, hover and focus, right? So, and a few other things. But those were, you could do some kind of interaction with those. We got JavaScript. You could do lots of interaction with JavaScript. It was the second coolest thing. The, the first coolest thing, just making random bits of your page disappear, non-interactively, to surprise people. Uh, what's the problem? Well, yeah, lots of things started going wrong. All of a sudden, you could have very interactive pages for some people. Uh, so plugins, and the two big problems with plugins were plugins were just all the formats were inaccessible. There was no way you could deal with them if you needed a screen reader to read Flash or you know, whatever it was. And the other problem was far worse, actually. They were keyboard traps. You'd navigate, navigate, tab, 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 tab. You know, we had all these big menus on the on the left hand side and you'd tab through all of those links. So after about fifty-five tab presses, you get to the plugin, and then you can hit tab all you want, because you can never ever get out again. That's what happened. That actually still happened. Um in CSS, you know, hover and focus are not the same thing, right? And that's why we have two different properties. So, so what's different about them? There's one really obvious difference. You can only hover with a mouse, right? So, so if you have a keyboard and people are relying on hover, you just can't do anything. What's different when you think about what people are doing? as they move around. Right? I am not sure. Right? I've had this argument with CSS people, like the guys who put these things in, and they're like, no, no, it's because you know, focus is for things that can take keyboard input. Like, yeah, like any interactive element. I move to it with my keyboard, and I hit a button, and it takes the input, right? No, no, but that's different. Oh, really? <laughs> so, uh, this, I think, was just a mistake that, that we made when we built those standards, yeah, that we didn't really think that through. Um, and JavaScript, you know, when you do stuff with mouse overs and mouse moves and you follow the mouse all around, it's the same problem, except 10 times over, because right? you can put much more interaction on you know, JavaScript-based stuff. You can use it to control lots of complex things. Luckily, in the late 90s, W3C set up the Web Accessibility Initiative. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of it. It's the people that made the web content guidelines, do all the accessibility stuff at W3C, and they were going to save everything. You know, we had access key, we had tab index, we said use these things. Don't rely on styles, don't rely on uh, scripts or plugins. What I'm actually doing is paying for airplane tickets. And I can only like send the authorization within three minutes or I lose my tickets. And they're for Friday, so I need to get it done um, before the guy closes. Which is fantastic, you know. We can solve all the problems, sort of. It's like, except you know, if you don't have style and script, you don't have a lot of functionality. I mean, people were just like, yeah, yeah, without being able to style and script stuff, I can't make a site that someone will pay me for. And 
you know, some developers like getting paid. Right? Who knew? Crazy guys. You know. Tab index was sort of a nice idea, but as Leone explained, you know, it was when you have to put a number for every single interactive thing, and you have to manage those numbers dynamically, it was way too easy to get it wrong. Uh, pretty much everyone who did it, pretty much, got it wrong. Some didn't. Right? An access key was considered harmful when considered harmful is you know, the way that you wrote articles which were, this is the spawn of the devil and all people who use it are evil. Um, does anyone know why? What was wrong with access key? It might override the users. Right? Uh, in particular, what happened was the HTML specification said you know, different platforms will have different ways of doing things. So on Mac, you use the command plus the access key. On Windows, you might use uh, Alt plus the access key. That wasn't actually any requirement anywhere. It was just you know, a random thing that somebody threw in the spec as, as advice. Terrible, terrible advice. Because the people who implemented browsers said, oh, I'm on a Mac, I have a command key, so I should make command plus access key do things. Like, yeah, right, because, you know, you never use the command key for other stuff. You never expect it to have some standard behavior and then get surprised when it does something different. Uh, so, so there are two people to blame for saying this thing is bad. One is a guy, my friend John Folio, and the other is a guy called Yuka Korpola, who comes from a little country in the north of the world no one will ever heard of. Um, and they explained the problems. What they were explaining is browsers did dumb things. They made bad implementations. Right? The problem of conflict is not that access key must conflict, it's that browsers implemented it really badly, right? really painfully badly. Uh, I'm going to come back to it, but those were things. So some stuff got better. You know, we, got, we got tab index equals zero. Originally, you couldn't have you know, uh, tab index, no, you couldn't have tab index equals minus one. You could have tab index equals zero, but it wasn't the way to do it. When you do that, you can just make things interact. Keyboard accessible. Uh, you know, the way to fix style issues is like better authoring. People learned about progressive enhancement. People actually learned how to make stuff better. Developers became more professional, more skilled, and understood different devices and systems. And that, that mattered a lot. And plugins and frames died, you know, sort of almost, finally. And that made a big difference too, in fact. That helped a lot because if you don't have plugins, then you don't have this, oh, my focus got eaten and I can't do anything on this page except close it down, maybe if I'm lucky, because when you're stuck in a Flash app half the time, you can't even kill it. Reboot your browser. Uh, one of the things that we did that some crazy Australian guy called Charles did um, primarily about 15 years ago was say, okay, so we have all these weird JavaScript things. We've got you know, mouse events and we've got keyboard events. And, and then you, know, you have to write different kind of JavaScript for the, for, you, know, you have the same thing you want to do, but you have to collect the keyboard stuff, you have to collect the mouse stuff, then you've got to collect the other keyboard stuff because it turns out that half your users have a French keyboard and the layouts are different. Plus, you know, key codes and character codes came out differently on different browsers. So you had to write like you know, piles of rubbish code, which is still all out there on the web and shipped, just to make you know, basic things happen like, I want this you know, fantastic new widget that I've invented to do its thing, make the cat dance most important functionality on the web. Uh, they're very dependent on what kind of devices you had. I said, yeah, that's, that's all well and good, but if we had you know, some logical interactions, you know, 
I move to this thing, you know, I want to activate this thing, then the browser could decide, like, oh, you know, the user key clicked the space key or the enter key or whatever key this browser always uses for activating things and pass an activate event. And we said, yeah, that is a brilliant idea. And we put it into DOM, went into DOM 2. You know, it was beautiful, the, the proper, sane way to do things. It was a total failure. I mean, it, it turns out, sort of 10 years later, that I argued you know, quite strongly with some people, yeah, that thing failed. It wasn't a good idea, and we should chuck it out. Why not? Why didn't it work? Well, it was a chicken and egg issue. Right? You, the browsers weren't implementing it properly. Developers weren't using it. Developers said, well, it doesn't work across browsers, and I've got to do all of the other stuff anyway, so why would I add even more stuff that doesn't actually work? And browsers said, well, developers aren't using this stuff. They're doing it the old way, so why would we spend you know, hundreds of engineering hours implementing someone, something no one uses? No chickens and no eggs, no joy. No roast chicken with omelettes for breakfast. They did do something else, though. They, they actually made things like click work, you know, whether you had a keyboard or a mouse. Uh, as more events came along, they followed that pattern a bit better. And, and in one case, we really, really hit the jackpot. We said, yeah, access key doesn't work very well. So let's do JavaScript to replace it, which is even worse. Why are JavaScript-driven keyboard controls worse than access keys? They don't work without a JavaScript. That, that problem was disappearing slowly. Um, and, and these are shortcuts, right? Or they should be shortcuts. You should be able to you know, trigger, because we're talking about buttons and things. If you have a function, there should be an HTML button that triggers it. So, you could just go tab, 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 shift tab, shift tab, shift tab, 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 click, and get there. How do you know what they are? There's no way of finding out what JavaScript key traps a page has set up. It might break the user's world. Nobody who knew anything about real development would do that. Turns out that if I have Twitter open, I go to a different page before I use any normal command in my system, because Twitter traps things that I expect to do some normal behavior that they do everywhere else. So nobody except the engineers at Twitter and a bunch of other places will get this wrong. The other place where you might have a keyboard shortcut you know, one of the coolest things that came to the web and making it possible to do really nice stuff for users was extensions. Firefox had this great idea. It's like we're going to make it possible for the whole world to you know, build up the functionality of browsers on their own. How do you trigger off your extensions? Well, if it's something you use once a month, you click a button. If it's something you use 27 times a day, and there are nine of them, and you've run out of room for buttons on the edge of your screen, you use a keyboard shortcut. How do you trigger that? Well, JavaScript is the obvious way, but how does the script know whether or not it's interfering with the script already in the page? So access key, in that sense, was much nicer. You, know, you can do a document.query selector all square brackets access key and find the access keys and see what's there. That's much easier. You have a way of actually working through things. But we knew that access key was bad, so we just left it alone for a decade. We didn't fix anything, we didn't solve any of its problems. We created new problems, new things that were difficult. Single page apps, Ajax. Yeah. It's like, oh, we'll have a link for a screen reader user, and what we're going to do is we're going to sort of push it off somewhere on the screen where no one can see it. So the guy who's actually a keyboard user tabbing around to get you know, the vital functions. Well, they've got their zoom at you know, three times normal size. They're only looking at a corner of your 
brilliant app, they just lose their focus all the time. We got video, we got flash, we got exciting stuff. We got keypads and touch screens as the web went mobile. So we got piles more new events. We got touch events and pointer events and people trying to do input on telephone screens. Um, and we got a bunch of new answers. We got gestures. They're mostly in browsers. That's because there's patents over using gestures to control things in a computer. Um, touch events. People said there are patents on touch events. Well, on some kinds of touch events, there are patents. If your touch event listens for an ellipse instead of a, you know, a circle or a square or some other region, I think you are still violating a patent. It might have expired by now, but we had to change the specification because there was a patent on collecting ellipse-shaped touch points. Um, we have visible focus indicators. Flash got accessible. Yeah. They did a pile of work to make it work much better than it had before. We got ARIA, as you know, Leonie's explained a bunch of that. And, of course, we got HTML5, which solves all problems, you know, feeds the cat, and washes the dishes. Right? If only I had HTML5, I would have you know, had my tickets paid. Um, actually, I do. So HTML5, what did it do? Well, it, it threw access key out. That was the first thing they did. And then they sat down and thought about it, and they put it back. Uh, we got content editable. We got video and audio. We got Canvas. We got inline SVG. You can see that these things can be interesting. ARIA got built into HTML5. And ARIA used to be this weird thing for XML land. And how many people developed in XHTML? A few. All the old people, right? ARIA was going to fit into this XHML, X XML wonderland of the future. And it did. It worked, um, which was great if you used X Smiles, another product from you know, a bunch of crazy developers in uh, Pampere, I think they were. Maybe it was Helsinki. Uh, but it, it didn't go mainstream. So HTML5 brought ARIA into the mainstream. We got landmarks, the you know, elements like article, nav, main, uh, opera. The browser, you know, when people started, you could navigate from heading to heading. But you know, in 2000, like five years of this later, you ask a JAWS user, it's like, can you find the main heading of the page? It was impossible. There was no way to get to headings in screen readers because they just hadn't implemented it. It's now generally reckoned to be the number one navigation method for all screen reader users. If you build a screen reader today, and didn't have you know, step through headings, people would just laugh you out of the country. Say, what are you doing? Um, but that was something we learned. And you know, so these HTML elements, the new semantic elements, like articles and aside, say, you know, yeah, it's also fancy semantics, and it's probably great for SEO, because everything semantic is great for SEO. Uh, it's also good for users. Because when you have extensions, and in a sense you can think of assistive technologies and extensions as the same bucket of stuff, right? It's things you add onto your system to make it work. And you can do things like navigate more comfortably and more efficiently if you put those elements in, if you use them properly. What we did lose is the rest of RHEL. So RHEL used to enable you know, this navigation, as I said. It used to be standard interaction. You know, I could press different keys that I'd set up on Opera to find a bunch of different standard places. Gone. You know, just forgotten, basically. That's a pity. Uh, we got ARIA, you know, live region and labels and, and cool styling hooks. You know, one of the nice tricks that ARIA gives you is, as, as Leone showed, you, know, you can get pretty nice ways of building things just with CSS based on ARIA roles and ARIA states. 
uh, we got videos and audios and graphics. And it came out, well, yeah. HTML5 video has controls. And you can get default buttons, play button, pause button, and you know where they are for any video that's an HTML5 video. That's actually quite helpful. Canvas was tricky. When we started looking at what do you do with Canvas, people said, oh, you, know, you have an alt or something. I mean, no one's ever going to use Canvas for you know, dumb things like a text editor. Um, so, you know, the first sort of big collaborative web-based text editors all used Canvas because it looked exactly right and it was efficient. Uh, Leone's colleague Steve Faulkner was one of the people who said, yeah, you know what, we should use image maps. It turns out that if you put an image map on a canvas, you can describe all of the regions you want. You can just live update the image map in the DOM. It's like uh, dozens of kilobytes of code to run image maps over a big interactive canvas dynamically updating. Dozens of kilobytes. Hey, you know, our pages are all 100 megabytes anyway. And they're like, who cares? That's nothing. It's really efficient. People said, no, no, that's a terrible idea. Can't do it. Probably can't be implemented. Dreadful. So Canvas is probably about to ship as a recommendation. And it's got you know, the last piece of work to, to get implemented and shipping and debugged. There's a thing called hit regions. Um, I don't know, does anyone know what hit regions do in Canvas? It's like you, you describe a region of the Canvas and you can detect when someone's clicked on that region. Totally different from image maps. So, Starts with H instead of I. <laughs> uh, it's slightly different, but really, you know, we're, we're learning that we weren't always stupid, among other things. And, and we're learning from some of the things that we did get wrong as well. Uh, you also get fallback content. Inside a canvas, you can put just plain HTML. If you go to the canvas with a screen reader, and I'll show you an example, then you can actually navigate -da -da -da. Come on, voiceover. You can act. Where am I? Lost. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Let me go here. Hello, mouse. Hello, mouse. So I can navigate this canvas with my screen reader. I don't know if you can read the transcript, but it's telling me all of this stuff. And that's because inside the canvas element is content that I can actually navigate around and use. It's actually a fairly simple approach. And for a lot of things, it's good enough. Uh, one of the things that SVG is doing is adopting ARIA. So you can use ARIA in SVG the same way that you can use it in HTML. That's pretty handy for a lot of stuff. Uh, some of the things that you would use SVG for are a bit different. So making SVG accessible, uh, 15 years ago, I wrote a document with a woman called Maria Rita Koivinen from Elisa. Um, it's just from this weird place you never heard of, of course, uh, about how the SVG format enabled accessibility. It's all there in the format. What you can do in the browsers today, 15 years later, is like, it's shaky. But you can make stuff work now. And it will work across browsers and across platforms. Yeah. There's still too much work for you, the developer, compared to what we should have. But you can actually make images and graphics that are interactive, and people can work with them. Does anyone work with content editable? It's lovely. It's wonderful. You just put content editable equals true on your whole page. And then people can. Edit stuff, right? Maybe. Sort of. Uh, yeah. If they hold their fingers in their ears, one leg up, up in the air, and it's a Tuesday and the wind blows the right way, it works exactly like they expect. It's a lot of interaction. Right? Editing, you know, there's lots of things you do when you're editing. And it's one unholy mess. All of the guys who you know, make JavaScript editors, there's a handful of small companies, mostly in Europe, 
producing editors used by tens of millions of people on millions of websites around the world. What they do to make those editors work is just about insane. Uh, it's very challenging if you want a really interesting project, but it shouldn't be that difficult. You should be able to say, oh, yeah, type some text, I just get text. Instead of, I have to listen to every key press and guess what every key press is doing and figure out what the user tried to do with their key press without really knowing what the rest of their setup is. So this is a thing that is being cleaned up at the moment. Uh, one of the big things is to get events that are not, you know, the user pressed the sort of third key from the left and you've got to figure out or guess what that meant to the user. Uh, it's the user wants to make something bold or the user wants to you know, scroll or the user wants to move the cursor around. And those things are, are not actually defined anywhere. We're slowly trying to define them and, and you actually now have browser makers and editing software people in the same room talking to each other about their code, you know, the code they have to write, the code they would like to be able to write and how we can get from here to there, which I think we will, and it will only take you know, four or five years. But you know, the world will be better in four or five years is better than, now. Nah, the world's never going to get better. So alongside what was happening in the editing thing, there was a group at W3C called Indie UI. Their idea was based on you know, the same stuff that I did 15 years ago that was a failure of getting events that explain what the user is trying to do. The group itself has stalled, partly because the people who are doing that mostly went off to do the editing stuff, which is the same kind of work in a, in a different group. Uh, you know, I strongly hope and actually believe that work will go forward. There will be more events that you can get which tell you what the user wanted to do so that you don't have to you know, try and create their entire interface and what button they should press because you don't know what buttons they've got. Um, there's another piece of it which is finding out the user context. Uh, there's a proposal by a guy called Brian Cardell for input modality. It's like, okay, so what did the user do? You know, did the, is the user using the keyboard now or the mouse or a voice input? And it seems like a great idea because it means that you can optimize for what they're doing. Um, but it doesn't take account of things like people use half keyboards. And people who have limited mobility, they'll only use half the keyboard because you hold down the space key and you get the other side of the keyboard. People who have a limited number of hands, which is less than two, will use tools like that, uh, or they'll use a specialized keyboard or they'll use you know, an Azerty keyboard because they're French. Um, so there are two sets of issues. One is straight out privacy. You know, fingerprinting was never a concern on the web in 2000 in the way that it is now. When you can find out exactly how users interact, you get lots and lots of information. Things like Google Analytics and Yandex Metrics you know, use that information to tell you about your users people have concerns about whether or not they should give it out. And more to the point, getting the specification right. Being able to really find out what the setup of this user is, that's mind-bogglingly more complicated than any of the stuff we've got. It, for an 80-20 solution, yeah, which is when you're doing things like site analytics for your marketing people, 80-20 solutions are often pretty good. When you're doing accessibility for you know, a group which represents 19% of the population, saying, what's wrong with the 80-20 solution? Like, well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, it's, it's really, really hard to find out what the user does and what the user has available and when and why they change. And it's probably not worth it, honestly. Do you really want to do that as a developer? Browsers should do that. In, in specification world, they talk about the user agent. It's like, 
because that's the agent of the user. The browser and the user agree between them how they're going to do the control for you know, some kind of action. And then they just send it off. They say, this is what I wanted. You know, let the developer build the functionalities. Let the browser and the user you know, who, who work together in the same room actually decide how they're going to interact between themselves. So I'll skip quickly. Access key, they changed in HTML. Uh, you can now put as many characters as you want. You have a list of different characters. You have a little DOM thing that's supposed to say, well, here it says yeah, it's actually supposed to say you know, control shift yeah is the key combination that will activate this control. Uh, that only works on, I think, Firefox, or one browser. And screen readers, if, if access key and a screen reader conflict, every screen reader I can find, the screen reader wins. So there's no problem anymore of, oh, you just overrode the default behavior of someone's system. The system wins. Uh, you don't have the easy shortcut, but at least you don't have hey, my, pro, you know, my software suddenly did something crazy I didn't want or didn't do the thing I needed. Implementation is still you know, limited, as I said. How do you know when access keys are there? It's not discoverable in any browser. Uh, some screen readers, if you get to the thing that had an access key, you know, tab, 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 78 times, it's saying, Important link, access key, I. Oh, if I'd known that 78 tabs ago, I would have saved myself a lot of work. How come users can't configure it? Yeah. <coughs> Fixing that is trivial. So, so access key has improved. It could do more. Um, I have a half done draft for how to improve access key, how to actually make it more useful. Simple things, allow words. If you have voice control, you, know, you should be able to suggest, here's a word that is a sensible word to trigger this command. If that word is already used by some other thing in the system, well, don't override the user's system. You know. Change it, pick a different one. Tell users that there are access keys and what they are. And that's, in an extension, it's a pop-up and a you know, document query. It's trivial to do. Let users configure things. And, and one of the things I'd like to see is essentially a game mode. Right? If, you, if you could specify access key, you know, the one problem is having to press Control shift q x r is much more painful than a JavaScript that just traps the R key every time. But if you set up a bunch of access keys and you say, all right, I want game mode in the browser, it's just like the user is going to constantly press these you know, five buttons and we know that it won't conflict with their system because we've got a way of querying what they are. We know that they can reassign them, but make this work so you know, I can play Space Invaders or whatever the most important thing in my life is today. Then access key would actually be really useful. Will that happen? I hope. You, know, you can do it in extensions. ARIA, as Leone said, ARIA works for screen readers. It's meant to work for assistive technologies. So riddle me this, is Zoom in your browser an assistive technology? Those who think it is? Those who think it isn't? Those who think it is after they've thought about it a little longer? How many people have used Zoom in their browser? Right. So you know, it's there to help you. Right. <laughs> it's there to improve accessibility, and, and there are particular sites where it's really important. You know, the ones with that little tiny grey text. It's very cool, but you can't read it. But it doesn't use the accessibility API, so it doesn't have any way of getting at any of the ARIA information. What I would like to see in my ideal world is when you say roll equals button, you should just get all the button behavior. And that would make developers' lives a lot easier. Instead of sitting down writing a pile of JavaScript to turn a link into a button, you say roll equals button and now is a real button. So the code that you probably got right, because you know, 
no big site ever ships code that doesn't work properly, especially in accessibility, would just be native code in the browser. Runs faster and reduces the amount of stuff you ship around, reduces your maintenance of code and so on. The big question on that is, will that be backward compatible? If, if you know, an ARIA slider actually became the same, you know, took the same browser behavior as a native slider control, would that break any website? We don't know. It, it's a question that I'm trying to get people to look at and we're trying to prototype these things out because I don't think it will. And I don't think it's hard to do for, you know, for things that have controls already. If you look at the WebKit code, which we did as an exercise for native sliders, and you look at ARIA, it looks very much like somebody already looked at the WebKit code back before there was native, back, back, back before there was ARIA code, and, and did something like you know, copy, paste, copy, paste. All of the events are the same, all of the parameters are the same, all of the values are the same. It's like this thing works exactly the same. So it should be easy to implement. Will it break stuff? That's the question we don't know. Supporting live regions is another thing. When you zoom up and something on the page that's outside the browser view changes, you know, being able to find out that a part of the page that, that the browser would be rendering but you can't see it has done something different, that's quite helpful for people who are using Zoom and looking at one part at a time. Uh, these are lively discussions. People disagree. You know, people of goodwill and, and intelligence. One of the guys I suspect of copying WebKit code into ARIA, for example, says, oh, I don't think that this is going to work out well. And he might be right. And, and if we have all of these events, you, know, you as an author, you make some brilliant new widget. It's like you want to describe a new kind of event. Because, yeah. you know, cat dot, you know, add event listener cat dances, right? or, or whatever it is. Part of being able to build up a world where you just say what the thing does and let the browser say how you trigger it means that you've got to be able to describe the functionalities to the browser so that it can assign interactions. Uh, yeah, how are we going to do this? It's hard to say. We used to have this thing called namespaced events. In the, in the XML world, you could just make up an event. You know, you'd put a namespace on it so you could be pretty sure that no one else was going to use the same name because the whole name is just some great horrible URL you know, plus the actual thing. Uh, we killed them. We threw them away along with the rest of namespaces. I went under the bus about seven years ago or something because you know, XML is bad, right? That's Doing that again is probably part of what we will want to do if we ever get to this glorious world. We will do it differently. It won't be the same as namespaced events because it will need information that can say what the event is actually meant to achieve and information that you can use to talk to the browser. Just a name is not enough. But we'll see what happens. That's speculative. And of course, web components. Yeah. Web components are great, it's the new thing. There was an idea that you could use web components to extend existing elements. So, you know, I've got a fancy button, uh, you use is equals, so you can say, well, this, if you can't do my fancy button, you can at least just use a normal button and it will more or less work. All of the examples were button, right? And all of the component buttons were buttons with you know, little butterflies on the top of something. So that's great. The, the syntax was pretty horrible. You had to actually use button is equals something instead of using your element name as the name of the new element because that's how you were going to get backwards compatibility. Uh, it wasn't very nice. What happens when you want to put you know, piles of elements together? And the, the great one is, you know, how do you do a date picker? How do you make a date picker accessible? Any date picker. Because they are universally problematic. They range from 
not very good to much, much worse than that. (laughs) That's about how it works out. A few things to remember. Number one, accessibility is not just screen readers. We talk about screen readers all the time because there's lots of technical material. It's an easy thing to think your way through in, in some ways, but there are a whole lot of other kinds of accessibility problems. Think about keys, think about Canvas, think about SVG, because it does keep getting better. Uh, and remember, native HTML, by and large, just works. It's quite cool that way. It might not look cool enough to sell to your boss, and that is a real issue if you can't sell your work. And apparently, there are still developers who want to get paid. So we never learn some things. Thank you. <laughs>